Okay, so uh, welcome tonight uh, to the August Education Night. It's a uh, case study night, so we're going to present three case studies for you. We are filming this for our uh, YouTube site, so welcome for uh, those out in the internet land. So tonight my case study is going to be on static electricity and exactly how much energy is required because uh, I, I had always read about static electricity but I uh, uh, never actually attended an incident where uh, I'd actually identified that as the cause. So to uh, read about it and to talk to other people about it, uh, such as John Gardner here, uh, it was very eye-opening as is to how much energy is required. So we'll go through tonight uh, what the incident I attended at the beginning of this year. We've got some CCT footage of the actual incident uh, and we'll break it down and why and what happened how it happened, and then we'll just talk about static electricity because uh, there's quite a bit to it, and then the characteristics of explosions. And then I've uh, actually been able to uh, look at the CCTV and break it down frame by frame, and that actually shows you everything that it, uh, occurred nice and nice and slow. And then we'll go into the origin, of course. So the incident was in February this year, Oschem. Weatherall Park. Now this is a uh, MHF, which is a major hazardous facility. Now that means there's a lot of stuff in there. There was 800,000 litres of ignitable liquid on site, from xylene to thinners to terps to kerosene. Absolutely everything that you want or you don't want in a fire, uh, it was there. Uh, what happened was they were transferring a uh, liquid of uh, all-purpose thinners from one IBC to another. IBC is a inter, inter, intercontinental inter, 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 intermediate, intermediate bulk. Yeah, uh, bulk container. So a thousand litres, so one cubic litre. Um, explosion occurred. Uh, two people were injured and uh, transported to hospital. So CCTV is here. Now the idea is to keep an eye out in this corner is where all the action happens. <coughs> So, we have two male employees, they are in the mixing area. Uh, this mixing area is actually funded off, it's like an L-shaped brick wall which <coughs> saved, in, uh, saved the rest of the plant going up. So these are all IBCs full of liquids, just here and here. <coughs> what they were trying to do is they had a small leak in one IBC, so they decided uh, that we need to transfer that liquid <coughs> from one IBC to the other. To do that, we will utilize a forklift. Now, the forklift is actually a uh, fire-safe forklift, so it doesn't produce any sparks. And um, this is what they were doing. <laughs> so as you can see, a uh, quite significant explosion has um, pushed that guy back, quite, quite a force. Explosions occurred, and then a fire ensued. And you can see that the fire has, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they give it a fair good go on this to try and get it out. Yes, they did quite well. I'll just go back. And uh, just do the video again. They use just basic Yeah, so they just used, uh, they had a hose reel, which was pretty small, but then they used a lot of uh, DCP, uh, dry chemical powder, uh, a bit of CO2. The video does go on. I'm only just giving you a short edited version. But you can see, oh, it's a bit hard to see, but what they are doing is they are attempting to earth, which will come into play later, earth the uh, both uh, containers. And they are about to, he's about to attach a hose connected to this IBC. Now you can still see the liquid bouncing around from the forklift was raised so that it's higher that so it would go in there. So what happens is you'll see the orange man will actually turn the, um, the nozzle open and that so the hose is going in now. See that bit going in there? He turns the nozzle open and within seconds is when the explosion occurs. So he's turned it on and that's where it's occurred there. Um, I you probably could, but I, um, I didn't get Channel 9 to do that for us, so uh, we'll have to go with what we've done. 
Right, so fire crews arrived, and yeah, large fire in the mixing area, two lines of 38 years of foam. Um, there's underground storage underneath the grill, you'll see the photos in a second. And uh, yeah, that fire continued underground into the next storage uh, abundant area. And yeah, obviously the force of the explosion has pushed the brick wall out, and you'll see in a second. So here we have <coughs> the scene. As you can see, the, uh, the forklift is here, and you've got our IBCs, which have been damaged. So this is the L-shaped uh, structure I was explaining, and it's done its job in terms of uh, protect all other areas uh, from uh, fire. Uh, so that now you can see how it's dropped down. It was up at a height during the, uh, the, the scene. So this is a, this is a, a large uh, storage container. It was um, empty at the time. These are our two IBCs. So that's on the outside of the wall. You can see the crack that it's uh, pushed out. On that, that pushing force, quite significant. So this is um, old mate's glasses. So he was standing obviously over here. He's been blown backwards and that's where we found his glasses. So that's what I've numbered it. So we've got IBC1, IBC2 and 3. IBC2 was the one being emptied into IBC3. <coughs> Now you look at IBC3 and you can see, you know, like without looking, I didn't have the CCT footage to laugh the incident, and you can say that this has obviously been the epicenter of the deflagration. And you can see by pushing out, these are the weak points here, and that's why it's sort of broken in that. But you can say, well, okay, this is where the uh, deflagration occurred. What's our ignition source? How did it ignite? Start looking at more, uh, there's an earth cable, so that would go into the IBC, and for here, that looks all, looks all pretty good. But then we look on the other side, and where the IBC2, and this is the earthing techniques that they are using. So we have a wire being attached, not at this end, but at the, uh, the grip end, the alligator end. Now that's not normal practice. And where's the other end? It's over here. Where was the other end? Now we are doing that with the same, uh, same clamp. They would get the frayed wire and then attach the clamp to that. And that's the other frayed end at the base of IBC2. <coughs> so the MCN was obviously three, the fourth with the swiper, so that was uh, ruled out. Then the employees introduced an ignition source, so that was ruled out as well. So let's talk about static electricity. What is it? Okay, it's just a, an electric charge uh, due to the loss of gain of electrons. Um, that electricity is, is a stored or potential energy, okay? Potential energy is source. Uh, and that's when you observe static electricity the most is when that discharge takes place. You rub your on the carpet and, and that's how you go. That's, that's when you see static electricity. And that, what is happening is, is there's a transfer of energy from a higher energy here, extra excess electrons, to less electrons, and that's that charging or the, the neutralization or the equilibrium of both. One, take, one body takes a positive, the other takes a negative. <clears throat> now I've got to make sure I'm correct here because I think I'll be uh, found out very easily with the experts in the room. So the charge remains on the outer surface of the bodies unless they come into contact with or, less, uh, or near a less charged, uncharged or oppositely charged body. At such time the charge may pass from one body to another and neutralise. When sufficient charge accumulates to break down resistance of insulation atmosphere, an arc of very short duration and electrical discharge occurs. So this is what this is this is our problem. <coughs> it is this resulting arc that is capable of igniting suitable flammable materials of gases, vapors, or dust. Proper grounding is required to prevent this. So it's a safety measure. It's a work practice that uh, is, has caused this. Static electricity charges are produced during the flow of uh, ignitable liquids or through turbulence. Mixing or discharging liquids into or from tanks of other containers. So this is the written literature in NFPA 921. Now, in dry air, when you walk along and you touch something in a room, that can produce electric discharge of 5 to 25 kilovolts. Kilovolts, 5,000 to 25,000 volts, and that energy is 20 millijoules. Okay. Now, the test that they've done on normal butane. 
uh, to ignite it requires 0.22, a quarter of one millijoule. So think about that. A quarter of one millijoule. That's all that's required to ignite pentane. Now, pentane is the main product of uh, petrol. So we're thinking now uh, ignitable, um, the uh, all purpose thinners. <coughs> So, combustion explosion, I class either deflagrations or detonations. Deflagration is that uh, slower than the speed of sound, so the propagation of the combustion zone. <coughs> uh, certain explosions will produce significant volumes of glass, which will increase the pressure within the body. A blast pressure plant is created in which expanding gases are moving away from the point of origin. So, this is something you've hardly, you don't really see. All you see is people explain it's, oh, it's a big fireball. But what actually happens first is a, there is a blast pressure front before the fire. How do you see that? Well, we actually, actually captured it. <clears throat> okay, so the front, uh, blast front is ideally uh, be spherical uh, and it would expand evenly in all directions. Okay, so and you, if for explosions to occur, you need to be within the LEL and UEL, so the gas, gas vapor. And uh, the ones near their optimum produce the greatest amount of pressure. That's slightly rich of the sodium region, which is the idea. <coughs> so these mixtures uh, produce the most efficient combustions, therefore the highest flame rates, the uh, greatest rise of pressure, and the maximum um, damage. <coughs> That's like Rosel. Rosel was an optimum mixture, huge amount of damage, collapse of structure, etc. All purpose thinners, just some basic information. The main thing is there, like flammability limits, quite high, that's bigger than petrol, so that's, I guess, more volatile. Uh, and auto ignition temperature 480, which is a little bit higher. <coughs> so, now what I've been able to do is at the 52 second mark, there was 25 frames. Or, uh, I was able to get uh, the five different, uh, I was able to get each frame by frame and actually um, look it out. Now, if you observe very closely in here, Frame five, frame six. There you go, back to frame five. So that is the blast, blast pressure wave. So it's very rare that I've, I've never actually captured it before. But from zero, so the ignition's occurred now, you get the pressure wave first pushing outwards, then you get the ignition, and then away it goes. So that was, that was easily done. Once I'd been able to look at that, I could see the actual blast pressure of the wave. So the hypothesis of the point of origin being obviously three is supported because of this, the damage, the CCT footage, and uh, once the valve is opened, it was only within a second or two, that the flow of liquid was coming from IBC uh, three to IBC two. So that, I'm sorry, the way around, IBC two to IBC three. So that means, that the grounding was not correct, a build-up of electrons was uh, created, and there was a devastated discharge. <coughs> Forklift was ruled out, there was no naked flames, mobile phones were out, they weren't allowed. Um, yeah, so they weren't, they weren't uh, introduced into the ignition source, and center was also ruled out. So it was an accidental fire, uh, the cause of the fire, uh, ignition of flammable liquid vapors due to a static discharge. The flow of liquid thinners from one container to another produced a static discharge, which produced a deflagration. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Just wondering, the, the uh, fact that work practices weren't followed. Yes. Did that avoid the insurance <coughs> policy? Or the cover? Yeah, good question. I don't know. I've, uh, I have my uh, work cover got involved. And I know that there was a lot of other work practices that were not were very dodgy, and um, yeah, they were. I think they were being prosecuted. No, but the insurance company be able to walk away. I'll just tell you, litigation is on hand for that particular. Oh, <coughs> and that's as far as I'm going to go. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Oh, did you attend this one? Um, no. Oh. Excellent. <laughs> I do have a second plate. Oh, there you go. So that's my uh, experience. So it's not much, it's a hefty <coughs> amount of energy is required to stack electricity to ignite. So be careful, you've got to earth. Yes, John, please. Yeah, I know you're quite going to say that while you're earthing it, this is one thing, but 
the other thing is really important is that the two containers have to be electrically bonded together so that when the bottom on one goes up, on the ah, so that normally you take it to ground. Yes. Assuming that it's a ground, yes. It's ground, but critical that the, the potential one is both be exactly the same because they might get good. Very good. What else stops you saying?